So it's eating, you know, 80 grams of fat per day and about hundred grams of carbohydrate and then um, the rest in protein. And um, in this scenario, again, my blood glucose was hard to control. My insulin use was high. What he had me do was significantly increase my carbohydrate intake to go from about hundred grams a day to within the first week, north of 500 grams per day. And then by the end of week three, I was over 650 grams per day. Okay. So that's basically a, call it a six fold increase in my carbohydrate intake. But simultaneously, as I was doing that by eating more carbohydrate rich foods, I was also substituting those foods for foods that were fat rich, like red meat, white meat, chicken, fish, olive oil, peanut butter, eggs, bacon, and beyond. And as a result, my fat intake went from about 80, 85 grams per day. Within the first week, I was down to about 30 grams per day. And by the time I hit week three, I was somewhere between 10 and 20 grams per day. So here I effectively switched fuels and I became more reliant on carbohydrate energy and less reliant on fat energy. And the question was, what did this do to my blood glucose values? And what did this do to my insulin use? Now, I'm a scientist. This, the medical world had taught me that every time you eat carbohydrate rich foods, your insulin use will go up, your blood glucose will go up. That's what they had drilled into my head. And I said, okay, I believe you. Let's see if this works. So when Doug told me, hey, I'm going to try and get you to eat a lot of carbohydrate. The first thing that I thought to myself was awesome. That means my glucose is going to go even higher and I'm going to need to use more insulin. So I guess I'll try this experiment, but I'm not really sure what's going to unfold. The exact opposite of what I thought was going to unfold actually unfolded. I predicted that my insulin use would climb from an average of 42 units per day, as you can see here on the left-hand side, to north of 60, maybe 70, maybe 80 units per day. But the exact opposite happened. My insulin use went from about 42 grams per day. And then by the end of week one, I was down to 32. By the end of week two, I was down to 26. By the end of week three, I was down to 23 units per day. So in a three-week period, I was able to reduce my insulin use by 43%. That's a big deal. That's a very big deal for somebody living with type one diabetes. But remember, my, my insulin use fell by 43%, despite the fact that I was eating six X, six times as much carbohydrate energy. So what the, the medical textbooks will tell you is that if you're going to eat six times as much carbohydrate, then your insulin use should maybe climb by six X or four X or five X or three X. It should definitely go north. It should go up. But instead, I was increasing my carbohydrate intake and lowering my insulin use, which no textbook, no blog article, no YouTube video, nothing told me was going to happen. So I thought to myself, wow, this is pretty incredible. The only single human being that knew this was going to happen was Doug. And Doug was the one who was saying, listen, this is the magic of eating a plant-based diet. One thing I did recognize was that my, my insulin use that had fallen by 43%, followed a similar trend as my fat consumption. My fat consumption, again, went from about 80 grams per day down to uh, about 10 to 15 grams per day. And so I, I said to myself, wait a minute, hold on a second. The two of them, you know, they're, they're not, they don't have the same slope, but at least they're both pointed in the same direction. They're both going negative or they're, but they both have a negative slope. That's interesting. I wonder if there's some kind of connection between the amount of fat that I was consuming and the amount of insulin that I'm using. Maybe insulin is dependent on fat intake, or maybe fat intake determines your insulin use. That's an interesting concept. So if you go backwards in time and try and take a look at how much carbohydrate, fat, insulin, um, I was using on a low carbohydrate diet and how that changed, you can see that my carbohydrate intake went from, like I said earlier, hundred to 125 grams per day at the beginning, north of 650. My fat intake went from about 80 down to about 15. And my total insulin use went from 42 units per day down to 24 units of insulin per day. So if you do a calculation to calculate your insulin sensitivity, okay, insulin sensitivity is basically the carbohydrate value on the top of 125 divided by the total amount of insulin, 42. So effectively what you're asking yourself is how much carbohydrate can you eat per unit of insulin? So if you take 125, you divide it by 42, you end up with a number of three. That means that prior at the very beginning of this process, every three grams of carbohydrate that went into my mouth required one unit of insulin. If you do the same calculation on the right-hand side, 650 divided by 24 is now 27 to one. So at the beginning of this process, three grams of carbohydrate equaled one unit of insulin. And now 27 grams of carbohydrate equaled one unit of insulin. This is a huge change. This is a massive change. And what that means is that my insulin sensitivity went from a three to a 27 
which is actually an 800% increase in insulin sensitivity. So this was the first time that I became aware that there was something fundamentally interesting that was happening inside of my body. And I was just looking for more information. I wanted to be able to explain it biologically rather than just telling people a personal anecdote and an end of one story that had no scientific basis. So in order to do that, I basically studied for, for the better part of two years just to get into UC Berkeley so that I could go do a PhD in nutritional biochemistry. And then I studied there for five years. And while I was there, I read thousands of scientific papers on the concept of insulin resistance. And I was given a specific task to induce insulin resistance in laboratory animals, and then reverse the insulin res resistance process using either calorie restriction or exercise. And as a result of doing that, I learned uh, an incredible amount of information about the, the biological processes that create and reverse the insulin resistance process and how that specifically pertained to me and what I had gone through. And then more importantly, how is this applicable to the wider population? Is this also applicable to people with type what, two diabetes, people with pre-diabetes? How about gestational diabetes? How about type 1.5 diabetes? And, and, and then also how about people who don't have diabetes? And there, this is where I really got an opportunity to delve into all of that research and try and understand how this insulin resistance game is played and what you can do about it. So here I am today. I've reduced my insulin use by 40%. Today on a daily basis, I eat more, more than 700 grams of carbohydrate per day. I inject approximately 25 units of insulin per day. And that is considered a physiologically normal amount of insulin for somebody of my weight and height. And my A1C values are consistently between 5.4 and 5.7%, which is technically speaking non-diabetic. So every time I go to the doctor and I get you know, a blood test, they take a look at my blood work and they go, huh, well, that's interesting. According to this, these values, you don't appear to be living with type one diabetes. Clearly whatever you're doing seems to be working out. So it's a completely different scenario than back in the day when my glucose was uncontrollable, my insulin use was high. Now I'm in a completely, uh, I'm in a much healthier state of metabolism. I've been there for 21 years and I hope that it continues to get better over the course of time. So uh, everything that I'm talking about today, including my personal story and beyond, is, is written about in this book, Matching Diabetes. So this came out in 2020, um, just before the pandemic hit and it became a New York Times bestseller. And I'm, I'm proud of that. And I appreciate all the support that we've gotten along the way. Um, if you have picked up a copy of this book, please let me know in the comments. I would love to get your, your feedback. And if you haven't picked up a copy of this book and are interested in this concept of, of, of insulin resistance, then I recommend going and picking it up because we've got a lot of positive feedback from people. And they say that it's completely transformed the way that they think about blood glucose control or blood sugar control, and that it helps them really understand what is happening under the surface and helps them get rid of a lot of the confusion that they see in the world of the internet. So let's get down into the science here because the science is really where, this is my favorite part of the game, okay? So you've probably heard this story before. This is the story that I was told when I was first diagnosed. They say all forms of carbohydrate, whether they are whole carbohydrate that come from things like bananas and mangoes and black beans and potatoes, or whether they come from refined carbohydrates like breads and cookies and crackers and chips and waffles and pastries and sodas, and white rice and white sugar, okay? It doesn't really matter. Carbohydrate is a carbohydrate, whether it's whole, whether it's refined. And when you eat those types of foods, they end up metabolizing to this stuff called sugar. And as soon as you say the word sugar, people think table sugar, they think of a white cube. So they go, okay, cool. Potatoes are made of carbohydrate. Carbohydrate causes sugar. Sugar is bad for me because sugar is going to raise my blood sugar. It's also going to make me fat. And then as a result of that, it's going to increase, it's going to cause a quote unquote insulin spike. That's what people with online will tell you. And so when there's an insulin spike, either that means that your pancreas is having to work in overdrive in order to manufacture a lot of insulin, or if you're injecting insulin, like I am, that means you got to use a lot of insulin in order to bring your blood glucose back down. So the, the general sort of rhetoric in the world of diabetes is carbohydrates are bad for you. Don't eat them because when you do, they metabolize to sugar. When you metabolize that sugar, it increases your insulin requirements. Okay. Here's the problem. Biological relationships are never linear. Absolutely never linear. If you actually take a look at a biochemistry textbook, and if you try and understand how chemical reactions actually are uh, designed and how they interact um, inside of a intracellular space or an extracellular space, what you will find is that biological mechanisms and biological pathways are horrendously complex. 
and they require they have multiple uh, multiple players that function in different parts of the cellular environment, and they have multiple feedback loops to control information flow and to control uh, nutrient uptake, nutrient storage, nutrient oxidation, and uh, movement of uh, information into the nucleus. They're very complex. And as a result of that, this picture, which you see on the screen right here, doesn't really fully describe anything worthwhile because it's just A leads to B, B leads to C, C is bad for you. It's just overly simplistic. The way that uh, biological mechanisms are actually arranged is like the image you see on the left-hand side. And this right here is just a tiny little snapshot of a giant subway map, if you will, of overall human biochemistry. So the deeper you delve into this, the more you realize that uh, trying to explain a potato using just one component of, of potato, which is carbohydrate, and then trying to come up with a whole collection of arguments about a carbohydrate and that being bad for you is just a biologically inaccurate way of, of analyzing a very complex food, undergoing a very complex biochemical process, undergoing a very complex collection of biochemical pathways that lead to a, an, an actual biological result, okay? So this model that you see on the screen, overly simplified, completely outdated, but yet it is still the predominant model. It is still the predominant conversation in the world of diabetes, in the world of blood glucose control. And my guess tells me that you've probably seen this argument online. You've probably seen it in some, you know, in a blog article, you probably talked to somebody, you might've seen it in some Instagram post somewhere. If the answer is yes, just go ahead and type it in the chat box. Maybe we can see that. But what I'm curious is, are, are you guys, have you type, have you seen this type of thing? Because this is what the general world believes to be a true statement. And um, I'd like to sort of get to a point where we can really understand a little bit more complexity and a little bit more detail because that's required if you're really going to get to a point where you're going to actually reverse insulin resistance. So I can see Brenda says yes, which is great. So if anybody else feels the same way, then go ahead and put that in there. Okay. So first things first, all carbohydrate on the left-hand side is not created equal. <laughs>